Amen. Jesus is the center of it all. Amen. Good to be together this morning. Uh, grateful to worship God with you. Uh, we are starting a new series uh, of sermons, of messages on Sunday. And uh, it's focused on the mission. And um, we're excited about the series. And I know when we talk about the mission, uh, so often we immediately go to a certain passage. Which is that passage? Matthew 28. I knew you were going to say that. Um, but, you know, and appreciate uh, Lynn Ottenweller. She was the major kind of architect of this particular series. It's cool. We kind of divvy up responsibilities. And uh, she was like, you know, that's, that's the easy way just to jump right into Jesus. But, you know, sometimes I think it's better to, to go back to the heart of God. Um, and the, the heart that we see that God exhibits before we start diving into what we're supposed to do for God is to keep looking at God's heart and be mesmerized by his heart and be inspired by his heart. And so that's my role, hopefully, today, is to really focus, focus more on kind of God's heart for humanity. And out of that heart, I think we can get the right framework for what it means to be on a mission for God. And, uh, and so I'm not going to be talking a lot about Jesus specifically in my particular lesson, but trust me, by the time we finish this series, we will have talked so much about Jesus. And um, in fact, these are the uh, upcoming series that we're going to do. We're going to have a message on eyes that see. We're going to have a message on hands that serve. Cause, and Ben Barnett's going to come preach, which is great. We love our brother Ben, right? And uh, hearts of faith. Hero Day, where we encourage people that have been a hero to us, and there have been many, especially over these last couple years, that have really come forward to help in so many ways, and we'll talk more about that. And Voices That Speak. So these will be kind of the, the messages that you'll hear, and hopefully, as a totality of all this, we will be inspired to, to really appreciate and, be, and consider it a privilege that God has allowed us to be a part of this mission, you know, to help save this crazy world that is in need of saving. Um, so let us go to God in a word of prayer. Father, we, we do appreciate this moment. We appreciate that out of this, this week that you've given us that we can take the time today to have a unique moment where we sing songs with many different people and hear different voices and we pray together and we hear a message from the word that you have given us and we take the Lord's Supper together. This is a unique moment and I, I'm grateful for it. Lord, help us to have the humility that we need to have to receive whatever you want us to receive today as we explore, honestly, God, your heart. And I, I just pray that we can appreciate how amazing your heart is. And uh, we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. How can we not start here? So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Humans are created in the image of God, made to be his image bearers on this earth. Amen for the aardvark. Appreciate the aardvark. <laughs> aardvark plays a role in this world. Appreciate palm trees. Appreciate oceans and rivers. They don't play the role that we do. I don't appreciate mosquitoes, and I don't appreciate <laughs> them at all. But amen, God chose to let them be here. But we as humans, we are made uniquely in his image. And we cannot forget that. And, and, and God gave us even a role of somewhat sounding like a privileged role. Like, wow, we can have dominion. Over, whoa, that's, we don't deserve that. What, what did humans do to deserve this great privilege? We've done nothing, but that's the heart of God. And, and, and Jeff, why did he give us this role? I don't know the whole answer, but one day we, we can find out maybe the full answer. But at least we have this, this record in the scripture. 
We don't have to question, why are we here? God's, we're here to be his image bearers. And he's got a role for us. So we don't have to feel aimless as we exist on this planet. Genesis 2. Just turn the page of the Bible, right? The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. Once again, it gives him a role, a purpose. The Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you do that, you will die. So what do we see from God? Wow. God's given the man freedom. Giving him a role, gives him freedom. You know, you freely do whatever, right? You just, just, but it gives him boundaries too. I know how, I, God knows how we flourish as humans because he made us. And we are not made to just have free willy, do whatever the heck we want, whenever we want. We need boundaries to flourish. God knew that. It was baked into the whole thing. You know, so, so that's, the, that's the beauty. But it's not a restrict. Do you feel, re- is this a restrictive moment? I mean, you are freely able to do so much. You know, but sometimes we give God really a bad rap. God goes on to create, you know, a woman. I mean, companionship. I mean, God is taking care of his humanity. He has given them an incredible, incredible environment for his image bearers. He gives them clear guidance on how to live in the new environment. And he wants to live with his image bearers. He wants to be with them, right? It's not he's dispassionate. It's not like, here you go, here's creation. I'm going to go on vacation. No, that's not what God does. He wants to walk in the cool of the day. He wants to, how are you doing? That's what God wants. But you know what? Mankind, we just struggle. You can't even turn another page until you find a guy named Cain, right? And Cain is, 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 is mad and angry. And what does God do? God tries to reason with Cain. Because here's the deal. God's not going to zap you into obedience. He's not going to force his image bearers to bear his image the way he wants to every minute of their lives. You can say, God, why wouldn't you do that? I don't have the answer to that. It seems like it would be better or easier, but he doesn't set the world up that way. He, he gives you the freedom to do stuff. And Cain is funky. He's ready to do something bad. And God's heart is, Cain, hold up, man. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do what you're thinking. This is not, this is not how I, what I created humans for. No, don't do it. He loves Cain enough to reason with him. But what does Cain do? Kills his brother. And here we go, right? It's bad enough Adam and Eve sinned and left the garden. Now we got Cain. I mean, it's humanity. And then by the time you get, I mean, you keep reading the Bible in Genesis, you're like, what are people doing? And then we get to the sad moment. In Genesis 8, I mean, this is sad. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humans was great in the earth. And just meditate on these words I'm about to read. And that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. How, in, wow, how much more thoroughly can you explain how bad things are? This is the antithesis of what God meant when he wanted to create his image bearers, give them a role, give them a plan. This is the antithesis of God's plan. But this is what happens. This is how humans are. And the Lord was what? Sorry that he had made humans on the earth. And it what? Grieved him to his heart. This is the heart of God. He cares about us. He he feels the sorrow and the grief uh, when we do not live in the way that he was hoping we would. All we needed to provide really was our obedience and our trust in him. He set it all up. And we seem to always find a way to circumvent that, right? And to go our own way. But you know what else about the heart of God that's really cool? Even as bad as the whole world, it's like, wow, you know what God's willing to do? The Bible says, but he found this one guy. And he found this one guy that was, that did have a heart that he felt like, you know, I can work with this guy. So instead of scrapping the whole plan, like, you know, humans are jacked up. I can't do nothing else for them. He's willing to stick with us, to stay with us, even based on the faith of one person. 
Wow. And so God, as is his right, he created everything. He can do with this creation what he wants to do. And when there's evil everywhere, he dealt with it. But, but because of Noah's faith, he kept Noah alive. And Noah kept the humanity alive. And then we see in other pages of the Bible, I'm skipping a lot because I don't have a ton of time, if you know what I mean. By the time we get to Genesis 12, God does it again. He's like, all right, there's a lot of craziness going on, but I'm going to find this one guy and I'm going to, I'm going to, then he, this, he gets a little crazy here. He like says, I'm, he promised, he makes promises now. Now he makes a covenant. I will bless you. I will make a great name out of you. I'll make nation out of you. Whoa. God's like binding himself to this old dude named Abram who couldn't even physically have kids yet with his wife. He was an idol worshiper. He's insignificant. Who is this guy? What is God doing? That's how God works. Why does he do it that way? You have to ask him when you get a chance. (laughs) But what we know is God cares, and he's a a covenant-making God, and he's a covenant-keeping God, even when we're covenant breakers. And he keeps coming after us. There's something in his heart. He just won't let us go. As evil as we get, he won't let us go. And he's he's always willing to find that person that is willing to have that type of heart to stick with him. And we know the story, right? By the end of Genesis, all his people end up in... In Egypt, that line of Abraham, they somehow, even though they keep messing up, they somehow stay alive. And he got a nice little pocket of people in Egypt. And you finish Genesis and you're like, yeah, I don't know how this story is going to end. And then you turn the page in Genesis and it's not looking good for God's people. You know what's going on there, right? The Bible makes it real clear what's going on. How many words can they give you? Therefore, this is Pharaoh, right? The, the, The king of Egypt, they sat They set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians subjected the Israelites to hard servitude and made their lives bitter with hard servitude and mortar and bricks and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. Do you get the picture? Once again, the language is clear and unmistakable. This was the situation. The, The world had gone way away from what God originally planned. This is not life in the garden. There is evil in the world and there is oppression for God's people. And so when we're talking about a mission, right? We're talking about this is the quintessential Old Testament mission. God's got to get his people out of there, right? And then the Bible says after a long time the king of Egypt died and the Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Their cry for help rose up to God from their slavery. God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites and God took notice of them. Unmistakable language. This is the heart of God. God, and you go, well, why did he wait so long? You're going to have to ask him that. I, I, can't, I can't give the reason. But here's the deal. God hears. The people groaned and, and God heard. God didn't just hear. God took notice. And God didn't just take notice. Guess what God did? You've already seen it done already a couple of times. He's looking for that one guy or that one person. And he finds this another guy who, once again, questionable resume. <laughs> questionable resume. <laughs> but there's beauty in his brokenness. <laughs> right? Right? You know what I'm saying? This guy was a murderous, angry dude. Right? Can fly off the handle in a heartbeat. And here's God. You know, God's like, hey, hey, Moses, you know, I've heard and observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry. And and, and you know what? You know, Moses go, amen. Amen, God. I'm glad you heard, because I was trying to do something. I was waiting for you, and you was taking too long. That's why I took that dude out. It's about time you got on board, God. And God said, well, I've, I've come down to deliver them from the Egyptians to bring them up out of the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. And Moses said, amen, God, now you're on point. 
yeah, Moses, I'm not done yet. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I've seen how the Egyptians oppress them. Well, amen, God, I'm glad you see it. All right, Moses, now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, Israelites, out. Hold hold up, bro. Hold up. (laughs) No, no. The the amens all of a sudden stopped. Then he starts stuttering. I I don't know what. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? God hears. God cares. God responds. And God sends messed up people to help him achieve great things. That's how God works. Why does God do it that way? I don't totally know, but I know enough to know that's how he does it. He hears, he cares, he responds, and he sends people. He could, he could, you could, you could say, why didn't God just kill Pharaoh, just lift all the people up, move them, like use the force or something, just move them all where he wants them. He could have. That's not how God chooses to work in his world. And so this is what God does. And so I want you to look at some of the language in this next part because, again, I got to kind of jump ahead, but, you know, the climactic moment of this mission, right? God's trying to deliver his people out. Right? He heard the cry. Moses has finally figured it out. And Moses goes and has his moments, but he's got the people like on the run. But all of a sudden, you know, Pharaoh's army's barreling down on him. You know, the climactic moment. But I want you to look at some of the language because we need to learn from this language. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, stand firm. And see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. And you have only to keep still. Who's providing the deliverance? Who? The Lord. Who's accomplishing it? The Lord. Who's fighting? The Lord. But if you're a human and you're looking at the movie scene, who do you see? You see Moses. And the temptation is to think Moses is doing so much. And here's what we have to hold in tension, in my opinion. It would be wrong to say, in my opinion, theologically wrong and wrong, to say Moses played an insignificant role. I don't think that's true. I think he played a significant role. But we also have to hold in tension the reality that God's doing the work. God's providing the deliverance. So, yes, there's a human element to this whole thing. But we got to keep the focus on God. And never, ever elevate what the person does over what God is obviously doing. We've got to figure that out. Or even a church. (laughs) Oh, North River is awesome. Oh, North River. Oh, no. Okay. North River plays a role, but we should never lift that that North River over God. That's what God is doing. And I I think we got to kind of remember that when we see this. And it, and it continues, and I, and I like the way it ends, too. Thus the, Lord, thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord. They believed in the Lord. And they believed in his servant, Moses. I like the order of that. I like the order of that. It acknowledges that some, God can use humans to help him accomplish his missions. But the, the humans, we're just servants. We're just doing what God, <laughs> God chooses to use us. We're just crazy, messed up people. But God can do crazy, amazing things through us. And so after this, right, you've got God's people, they're out, and you think the story's over. Yes, the deliverance has happened. Amen. 
But don't forget, guys, yeah, God frees us from the crazy life that we used to have and the oppression and the slavery and the forced labor and all that. But guess what? He takes us somewhere else that's better. But guess what? It's like back to the garden. Okay, now I need to show you how to live. In the garden, he was like, hey, just don't do this one thing. He said, I'm going to get a little more, more specific next time with these people. Let me give you these Ten Commandments. Let me hook you up because you guys can't figure out how to treat me or each other. But the reality is God calls us to a new life, but he teaches us to live it too. And, and so I think that's one of the keys that we got to always remember. Amen for God saving us from the crazy life. But we also have a life to live now, but oriented toward God in response to him living as his image bearers in this world, that has to be our number one priority. And that's why God would send the prophets because why the people were they, they going the other way. Oh, God sends the prophets. You need to come back to God. Remember the covenant. God is good. God's way is better. Don't, don't live like everybody else around you. Don't treat things like they treat things and people like they treat people or money how they do it. Or, oh, don't do it. God has a way. And ultimately, Jesus comes and he tries to embody that, right? To, to really not, God doesn't just give a tablet of stuff. He enfleshes himself and walks among us to show us how to live. Um, and notice the heart of Jesus. See if this sounds familiar to you. Again, I, there are other people that are going to go deeper into the, but just notice the heart of Jesus. Does this sound familiar? towards the end of Matthew's gospel. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I've desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood on her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. Do you see the heart of God here? Jesus cares. Why? Because God cares. He's the son of God. And when people don't respond, it hurts. Okay? And that's the heart of the mission. And, and I, I wish we could keep it there. Like, I, I so wish I could always keep it there. You know, this is the heart of Jesus. It's not about nothing else but, but the heart. And, I, and I, what I wanted to share with you now is just some of the challenges that even I have had trying to have this heart. <laughs> Um, because the reality is, like for me, like as I've shared before, I was grateful to be redeemed from my old life. And man, I got baptized. I was so grateful. And before I knew it, I was serving in the ministry full time as a one-year-old Christian and having to preach stuff. I, I barely even, I hadn't even read the Bible yet, to be honest with you, the whole Bible. And so there's, it was just crazy. But, um, one of the things was, like, there was a passage that we used a lot, and you mentioned it. It was Matthew 28. You know, go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them. And, and, and so for me, what I didn't realize is almost, it seems like every Sunday somehow that passage would come up or I'd feel compelled to use it or the other guy was using it. Every leaders meeting I went to, we kept using it everywhere we go. We go to a meeting and, hey, let's have good news. Hey, well, I, I met this person and they're going to come to church or Oh, I baptized this person. I'm like, why is everything on the good news always about who's coming to church or who got baptized? Why is that the only way to have good news, you know? And I started getting all rebellious, and I'd raise my hand like, yeah, Jeff. I said, oh, my daughter got an A on this test, and I'm really, really happy about that. You know, it's really good news. It's really good news. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, next person, you know. <laughs> you know, but, but what I'm trying to say is I got to a place where the mission was more about the plans of, of man than the heart of God. That's where I got. It was more about growing the church than about exhibiting the heart of God for, for people. And I, I'm a minister, guys, so I'm standing up there feeling stuff and feeling discouraged about it. Like, almost feeling like, what are we doing? Like, I know some people had great hearts, but I was just starting to get weird. Like, it almost felt like we were baptizing Pharaoh. You know what I mean? Like, okay, go make more disciples, you know, make more, make more, you know, and using his 
apl applying his methods to get people to produce more. You know, that's where I, I felt that way. And then I felt like I'm the minister, so now I got to go turn around and do that to the group that I'm supposed to lead. And I'm so grateful to be here that I've never had, I've never felt that way here. I can honestly say that. I've never felt any pressure to do that. This is early in my time. But I think some of y'all were in that, have been in that place where the mission to you, you have funkiness because it, it was a church growth mechanism more than it was the heart of God. And I had to, I had to stare that in the face um, and I've had to wrestle with that and this message has helped me. The mission is not about people's plans, it's about God's heart. And the other thing I had to deal with is you know, don't forsake God's mission because of your issues with the church. And what I mean is, I've been there. And it's even worse for me. That's what I said. It's embarrassing on some level to share because I'm supposed to speak on Sundays or whatever. There have been times where I didn't even want to bring people to church because I didn't really like the church for whatever reason. I didn't like what, the way we did this or how we did approach this or and, and I, would, I would actually kind of curtail my heart for the mission, like to even that, that part of the mission that is to help people, to, to bring them to the community of believers, to, to, to help them see what a community of Christ followers looks like. Like I had missed all that because I was like done with all this grow, grow, this, that, man, I'm done. And I don't even like how, man, we just going to make people feel like they're this or that. And here I am, one of the ministers, I don't even want to bring people to church. What does that mean? That's bad. Like, who am I? Who am I to withhold the message that God has because of my junk and my baggage? The church is always going to be jacked up. <laughs> Don't you understand, Jeff? That's why we, I've said it a million times, we wouldn't have most of the New Testament if not for a messed up church because they had to write the letters because the church was so messed up. And that's what we call the Bible, the Word of God, because the church is messed up. Because you and I are messed up. Because people have been messed up since God made people. <laughs> so who are you? Who are you to not bring somebody to church? Yeah, man, I'm telling you, it's like. But that's what I was doing. I'm t that's where I was. But some of you are still there. You justify your lack of heart for people because the church is messed up and that's where you still are and I'm telling you it's wrong and I've been there and it's not a good place to be I implore you remember the heart of God and uh, you know I I've had to do some studying and stuff obviously for school and uh, it's interesting like we're a part of what we call the restoration movement of churches, amen? A few hundred years, whatever, you know, it's been around and based on, you know, centuries before that. But the concept of restoring kind of early Christianity, like it got messed up and we need to restore the early church kind of stuff. And um, which is fine. There's a lot of great stuff. But the, the reality is, just so you know, that the early church, they didn't really <laughs> emphasize evangelism <laughs> the way we do. And that's one of the things that I want to inspire you with is that the early church actually had more faith that if you put in the very center, live the way Jesus lived, right? Let him live his life through you. You know, be a community of, of, of followers. You remember what Jesus taught, the Sermon on the Mount, like love your enemies? Like do that and the world will take notice. Yes. You help the poor the way that Jesus did, you, the world will take notice, Right? The early church couldn't invite people to their services because they could get killed or get in deep trouble. There were political, uh, the po politics was against them, social conventions against the Christians. Th there was no reason, there were no incentives to become a Christian. There were more incentives to stay away from Christianity. But what happened? It kept growing. And they, and they had, there, you have to search centuries to find anything on evangelism. <laughs> because they just, what they put in the center was live the life of Jesus. And that's why this guy Cyprian, you know, we are philosophers not in words, but in deeds. We don't speak great things, we live them, right? And, and, and so 
I just want to encourage you and inspire you. If we are devoted to Jesus' teachings, we surrender to him and submit to him and let the spirit take us over and we live just relentlessly like Jesus lived and refuse to live the way everybody else, they will be attracted to us. And that, my friends, is how the early church grew, more by people being attracted to their example than them feeling compelled to go out and invite somebody in. So I just want to at least give you that too. Let's keep sharing our faith and keep inviting people to our small groups. I hope we do that. But let's also have faith that we could, we could grow because it's God's mission and he can do it however he wants to do it, right? And I hope that we can center who Jesus is and uh, his teachings more than anything else, right? And so I'm going to say a prayer for the Lord's Supper. We'll take that together. We'll have a little bit of piano music in the background and uh, help you reflect. And uh, hopefully we can appreciate the heart of God. Let's go to God. Father, so grateful for this opportunity to express our gratitude for you, to remember how much you love us and you just refuse to give up on us. We thank you that Jesus exemplified that. We're grateful that when we take this into our body, this bread that we see as the body of Christ and this fruit of the vine as, as the blood of Christ, that we take it into ourselves and we, 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 we do this in a way that we know it bonds us and connects us to one another and to you and we proclaim that we believe it to be true, that you have delivered us through Jesus and that Jesus is coming back and then things will be like they were supposed to be from the very beginning. We proclaim this now in the name of Jesus, amen.